we're going to get back to this. So, this is The Demonism of Creation in Goethe's Philosophy by Nicolai Rambu. I apologize for how I'm saying your name. I don't know how to say anything except for very boring English. Um, in Transform a, a Cow, again, this looks like maybe a uh, Portuguese language journal, but yeah. But okay, let's give it a shot. And so we're going to talk, it's tomorrow's Halloween, so we're going to talk about some demons or demonism of creation. You just read the article and they proved that entangled particles can communicate faster than light. So there we go. Um, warp drive, here we come. I mean, that's very excited, exciting. So maybe we will have faster than light communication under certain uh, conditions. And that would be great for, you know, lots of things. Granted, I don't want it to break causality. Like, you can't, if you go faster than light, then, like, you might be able to break causality. <laughs> but I doubt that'll be the uh, outcome. But, yeah. But, like, like if we have somebody in outer space and we want to communicate with, uh, you know, like a very far away thing, waiting, like, half an hour for our communications to get there is not ideal. So, if we can, like, pre-entangle some particles and then, like, have one particle here and one particle on, like, you know, Mars, and then we can, like, you know, tweak the particle here to, and have it immediately, tw uh, you know, reflect the message on Mars, that would be um, super good. <coughs> so, yeah, I mean... Early, of course, physics is like is all theoretical, but like if they can do that and show there are results, that's like super good. <sighs> One about a, a strange exercise: the elegy from Marion Bend, Marion Bad. In one of his discussions with Eckerman regarding the demonic, Goethe makes the following mentioning, which is often quoted in the works dwelling upon this subject: that. In poetry, especially in that which is unconscious, before which reason and understanding fall short, and which therefore produces effects so far surpassing all conception, there is always something demonic. And uh, I don't know if you can see, but they have used the old style spelling of demonic here, with the uh, ligature between the A and the E. Um, so, like, again... What exact is this a tap, uh, uh, an actual demon or a technical word of something sort of different? The demonic, as Goethe repeatedly maintains, should not be confused with the diabolic. It, rep it represents the mysterious power which can be manifested not only in certain personalities, but in things, events, or entire epics. So, okay. So, the, demon the diabolic, I guess, would be the evil. But demonic, on the other hand, is a mysterious power. So it's just sort of mysterious and not tinged with the uh, evil sort of theory. In Poetry and Truth, the author says, This demo demoniacal element can manifest itself in all corporeal and incorporeal things and even express itself most distinctly in animals. Therefore, we can't but be surprised by the fact that Goethe asserts that the demonic may take the strangest forms in animals since a fragment of the New Testament chosen by Dostoevsky was, was to serve as an epigraph for his famous novel, The Demons, which was based on this. Based on the gospel according to Luke, a demonized person was healed by Jesus because he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. Yeah, so this seems like what the context um, Goethe was in was that demons were diabolical. But okay. But that doesn't mean Goethe, of course, had to follow that. Demons pass from human to animals. They rush to a cliff towards the sea and get drowned. Then people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found... <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry about that. Then... People came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demon had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Okay, so Jesus somehow 
got the demons to flee from the man who then uh, was in right mind. In order to support the idea underlined in the present essay, the fact that the demon, or in Goethe's vision, the demonic, manifests itself both in humans, animals, and things, which is not so important as it is it as it as it is its shift from one to another. It goes without saying that both Goethe's demonic and the exercise dwell further upon having almost nothing to do with the ones rel related in the New Testament passages mentioned above, nor with the mystical and occult practices originating there. Nevertheless, this analogy is necessary. Like the unclean spirit from the bib biblical story, Goethe's demonic comes out of him and passes this time not into an animal, but into a thing which can be found in the fascinating elegy from Marion Bad. More specific into pigs, I think that's why I can't eat pig. Um, I don't know. Like, I mean, I don't know the theory on why. I know there's a few religions out there that are, you know, you can't eat pigs. I, I don't know if, like, the stuff, uh, Vipers, are you, um, looking at, like, pictures of women not, uh, in clothes again, Vipers, and that's what you get into? You're making a mess of your socks. Um, okay, I mean, that's interesting, Victor. I did not know, like, um, that somehow things were getting, like, you know, demons were getting passed, and, like, spirit was getting, like, the, uh, had to do with, uh, pigs. But, yeah. Uh, like, religion is, like, something I don't know enough about. Or even, like, whatever these theories are. Like, I know in Islam and Judaism, they have different, uh, you know, what what can be eaten, in, but I don't know why exactly. <coughs> People moved by this mysterious force, known by Goethe as Das Dimonish, behave like actual instruments in the hand of a mighty force which fate fatally traces the road to be followed in order to reach a certain goal. Goethe himself says that something demonic prevailed which was not to be resisted, which determined him to write the metamorphosis of plants and to meet Friedrich Schiller in a certain circumstance or to travel at a certain time to Marienbad. He is fascinated by demonic personalities, such as Napoleon or Byron. Nevertheless, Goethe specifies that demonic people, always the most eminent men, either morally or intellectually, and it is seldom that they recommend themselves to our affections by the goodness of hearing. A tremendous energy seems to be seated in them, and they exercise a wonderful power over all creatures, and even over the elements. And indeed, who shall say how much farther, farther such influence may extend? All the moral powers combined are of no avail against them. Okay, so this is, you can see right here why someone like Nietzsche would be fascinated by Goethe. Because all of a sudden you have someone standing above all the old morals. So this is the exact sort of thing that Nietzsche would have probably jumped on. Um, so yeah. <coughs> but like, yeah, if you're going to have someone that is somehow just driven and creates things, then you're going to have like this sort of thing. <laughs> Uh, vipers, yes. I mean, this is probably translated. Continuing. We will try to illustrate the demonic element in the artistic creation by one of Goethe's works. We will refer particularly, particularly to the elegy from Marion Bad in order to highlight the extraordinary relation between demonic author Goethe and his work. Generally, when a work was finished, it became uninteresting to me. I thought of it no more, but busied myself with a new plan. Nevertheless, Goethe had a special relation with two of his works. The first one is The Sorrows of Young Werther. The other is Par Excellence, which is a demonic work, which is a demonic work, is Elegy from Marion Bat. Although both of them saved Goethe from some desperate situations, these two works represent, at the same time, two extremes of the way in which their author saves himself by transposing his suffering into poetry. So this is the thing. I mean, this is an old, old thought, of course, that you can transfer your uh, suffering into poetry somehow. You can make some uh, artistic thing and that way you can uh, heal yourself or am ameliorate your uh, pain. Um, like lessen your suffering. So yeah. And so is the question is that sort of demonically uh, 
is that like uh, influenced by something outside of you? Is that demonic power? Some sort of uh, the artistic channeling? Okay. Two, a book like A Postponed Suicide. The Romanian philosopher Emil Chiron. Ooh, interesting. So this is one of uh, Aristotle's favorites peoples. The Romanian philosopher Emil Chiron said that any book is a postponed suicide. The Sorrows of Young Werther is a perfect illustration of Chiron's idea, as stated above. If we refer strictly to the epic plan, this book about suicide is the one which really saved Goethe from the suicide that could not be postponed otherwise. This is not an interpretation or a speculation, but Goethe's testimony in, po in Poetry and Truth. Quote, By these convictions I freed myself not so much from the danger as from the whim of suicide, which in, the, in those splendid times of peace and with an indolent youth I had managed to creep in, had managed to creep in. Among considerable collection of weapons, I possessed a handsome, well-polished dagger. This I laid every night by my bed, and before I extinguished the candle, I tried whether I could succeed in plunging the sharp point a couple of inches deep into my heart. Since I never could succeed in this, I at last laughed myself out of the notion, threw off all hypochondri hypochondriacal fancies, and resolved to live. So that's interesting. Full paper saves lives, okay? Uh, a uh, well-timed book project might save lives. I don't know about fill papers. Although, maybe. I mean, you can, as I've shown, you can do more things with fill papers than probably other people. Like, there's more things that can be done with fill papers. Um, like, it's a social network. Um... Like, uh, if you're not a philosopher, you don't realize how many things are actually on it, but it's got, like, job listings and so and stuff like that. So, yes, Phil, the whole Phil Paper Network is uh, rather impressive at this point. Okay, continuing. At this point in... At this turning point in Goethe's life, the masterpiece The Sorrows of Young Werther is born. Subsequently, this is what Schleiermacher called, using a term difficult to render in another language, some German I can't speak, but begins with a K which was the seed that germinated and gave birth to the author's soul in his next work. The, song, the Sorrows of Young Werther represents, as it results from poetry and truth, a real po postponed suicide because, according to Goethe, only the suicide fixation was thus defeated without the suicide project, for he will need this plan at a certain moment in his life as part of the survival strategy. Okay, so the idea is that he can use his fixation with suicide, but not the actual plan or project of doing it. So. <coughs> ah, shoot. I'm going to have more. Um, uh, that's a good question, Vipers. I mean, maybe he had, like, a different flavor back in the day. Maybe it wasn't the caramel. Um, and he felt bad, so he had to make an original caramel flavor. I just don't know. This is, you know, remember, this is, um... Probably early 1800s. I don't know when the Werthers uh, came around. In order to detach himself temporarily from the suicide fixation, Goethe determines Werther to commit suicide for him, creating thus a character who decides to die so that his creator may live. This is one of Goethe's shocking testimonies regarding the origins of the sorrows of young Werther. Quote, but to be able to do this with cheerfulness, I was obliged to solve a, po a poetical problem by which all that I f had felt, thought, and fancied upon it, this important point should be reduced to words. Yeah, so this is the point, is that he wanted to kill himself, but instead he had to put ink to paper. How do you convert the desire to kill yourself uh, into, um, you know words on page words on page is very different than like words in your head if anyone has ever tried to write before you will know like you can spill out ideas onto the page but writing it down in a way that other people can understand that's completely different if we make a distinction like Goethe does between the suicide fixation and the suicide project which is nothing else but a less fixed idea what the I don't know what the sentence is. Uh, an idea we should accept regarding the last play as being an essential part in keeping the human's dignity until the very last moment of his life. Okay, so the idea is fix an idea that we should accept regarding the last play, the last moment in your life, as an essential part in keeping your dignity until the last moment of your life. So you have to hold on to your life as long as possible, keeping this idea in mind. For when dignity it is brutally... when 
for when dignity is brutally canceled, the suicide project must be put in application so that the life could maintain its sparkle until the very end. This is the main idea of the Stoicism. Stoics and of other several philosophies which gave suicide the place it deserved in the human axiological universe and reflected profoundly upon it. See, I didn't know that Stoicism put uh, suicide so high up, but that's interesting that th you put it somewhere. But I mean, I guess that's fair. A lot of philosophies have a lot to say about suicide, whether you should do it or w under what conditions you're allowed to do it or just not do it at all. The Sorrows of Young Werther expresses the strange, tragic joy produced by the thought that somebody sacrifices in you their place and that a dear person dies so that you can continue living. That is why the author's relation with this work has always been tense. Goethe will come back to the Sorrows of Young Werther like a criminal to the crime scene. He often talked about his weird disposition when he was forced to reopen the pages he had written in order to get rid of the suicide fixation. Unlike his usual behavior, Goethe tells nobody about this creation during its becoming. It is like a secret, and that is why Goethe's friends are surprised when they are offered the manuscripts of the Sorrows of Young Werther in order to read it at the end of the creation process, that is, four weeks. Okay, so he busted out a book in four weeks, and they're like, oh, I thought you would have told me if you were writing a book. But then they find out, oh, it's about a guy killing himself, and they're like, ah, oh, we understand why you kept this one quiet. Quote, uh, quote, for by this com composition, more than by any other, I had freed myself from that stormy element upon which, through my own fault and that of others, through a mode of life both accidental and chosen, through design and thoughtless precipitation, through obstinacy and pliability, I had been driven about in the most violent manner. I felt as if, after a general confession, once more happy and free and justified in beginning a new life. Well, I mean... That's the whole point. It's like born again at this point. You've got rid of whatever was, you know, causing you to want to die. And then being, um, by putting it, it into the words on the page, somehow that has, uh, taken it away. Okay. A tragic reality had thus become a masterpiece of German literature. After he had saved Goethe from suicide, the book about... The sorrowful Werther has still a rather perverse effect. It drives people crazy and makes them sick. Wart mania, becoming a malady, which pervades the spirit of the time. By a mysterious process, the suicide fixation of which Goethe freed himself by writing The Sorrows of Young Werther is transferred to the public. Here is the author's confession in this respect. But while I felt relieved and enlightened by having turned reality into poetry, my friends were led astray by my work, for they thought that poetry ought to be turned into reality, that such a moral was to be imitated, and that, at any rate, one ought to shoot oneself. What had first happened here among a few afterwards took place among the larger public, and this little book, which had been so beneficial to me, was decried as extremely injurious. So that's super interesting. Like, uh, so he wrote this book as a way to get out of his own suicide, uh, suicidal thoughts. And instead, by, you know, describing the thoughts, other people started to take them on. And it became a little scary. Um, so we've got a public madness now because of this book. That's interesting. So how do you do that? Like, the idea that you're getting thoughts into people's heads and then they are taking them on as their own and especially dangerous thoughts like killing you know murder and stuff either yourself or somebody else that's bad so okay as madame de stale said werther caused more suicides than the most beautiful woman in the world how were the persons with suicidal tendencies supposed to react to the sorrows of young werther it was not Goethe's character, the one who should have been imitated, but the author of this character. In Poetry and Truth, Goethe dedicates many pages to the sorrows of young Werther, as if still amazed by the devastating effects of the book on, on the audience. In addition, the amazing success of a book tells always more about the audience itself than about its intrinsic value or about its author. Goethe himself was aware of the fact that the success of the book was due to the fact that it appeared at the right time, that age being hunted, haunted, or hunted by the idea of suicide. Uh, <laughs> 
And Viper says, that explains why in the late 90s, if you wanted to be someone's lover, you had to get with their friend. And Valpo's angry because uh, Viper's beat him to the punch. How you doing, Valpo? <coughs> yeah. I mean, being scooped is not fun. Okay. Therefore, not only has the sorrows of has the sorrows of young Werther caused a massive wave of suicides, instead of many self murders, <laughs> instead many self murderers wanted probably to be associated with Werther and their gesture acquiring thus a highly spiritual connotation. Oh God, I'm sorry. That's what you're spending your Sunday night doing, Valpo. But yeah, that's work. Get that logic exam graded. <sighs> yeah, so. I mean, this is one of the things. People want to feel like they're important. And so reading a book about someone who is highly sophisticated or has some spiritual connection and therefore does some act can make you doing that same act for not very good reasons. You can like imagine that you have similar, um, you know, great uh, ideals and like reasons. Quote, the effect of this little book was great, nay, immense, and chiefly because it exactly hit the temper of the times. For as it requires but a little match to blow up an immense mine, so the explosion which followed my publication was mighty, from the circumstance that the youthful world had already undermined itself. The shock was great, because all extravagant demands, unsatisfied passions, and imaginary wrongs were suddenly brought into an eruption. Yeah, so it's like if you get people that need something, you can light the powder keg. And a book can do that. Um, in the United States, um, the Civil War was said to be uh, basically started by Uncle Tom's Cabin, um, which is a book about, uh, you know, a, a slave and his dignity, even as it, like his life gets worse and worse, how bad his life had to get so that he could like, you know, support his family. But like, that's where the term Uncle Tom comes from, because he had like basically to give up what he like his dignity had to do things against his own people in order to like survive. But like that, uh, that the horror, like the horror that. Bop, bop, bop. CJ, and all of a sudden my alerts are working? How did my alerts start working all of a sudden? CJ, how are you doing? What's going on? What were you up to? <laughs> Thank you for the raid and bringing everyone over. Um, what's going on, CJ? We're doing a, uh, you know, I'm reading my philosophy stuff for everyone who doesn't know. Um, one of the things I do here, besides play Minesweeper, even though I haven't done that in a while. Oh, Club Penguin. Yeah, you and your Club Penguins and the other stuff like that. Were you doing, um a uh fundraiser tour i think let me give you a shout out c j yeah so if anyone doesn't know uh twitch actually did a thing if you are not already following cj there should be a box at the top of chat you can do a one click follow there that would be very cool if you did that so cj get yeah, follow cj is a fellow minesweeper player um and so like one of the best in basically the world at minesweeper um, so, but yeah, also plays Club Penguin and some other classic, uh, games. So yeah, cool. Um, yeah, I'm reading something on the idea of demons in your head and what they make you do. Not in a religious sense, but, um, in sort of like an artistic sense. But yeah, so I actually, yeah, I'm trying to work on the, uh, shout out command I have. And I can't believe like somehow, um, oopsie. Hmm. Like, my alerts have not been working. Oopsie, I screwed that one up. Let's see. This should work, though. So you, you can see uh, CJ's little low. <laughs> there we go. CJ from NJ. No. Uh, CJ's originally from New Jersey. Um, so. Oh, okay, cool. Well, thanks for bringing everyone over, CJ. Um, much love. Appreciate it. But, yeah. So, uh... Yeah, this is me. Feel free to ask any questions if anyone's new here. Like, this is my first time reading something. We just read it, discuss, shoot the shit about philosophy or 
whatever. So feel free to ask any questions. But like what happened here was Goethe back in the 1800s or maybe late 1700s wrote a book because he was feeling suicidal. And then all of a sudden people started reading his book and getting suicidal. And so we was like, we're, he basically created a mass hysteria. And uh, so this is what we were just talking about, like mass hysteria, you know, Halloween stream. So, so it's like all imaginary wrongs were suddenly brought into an eruption. So people were feeling bad, and then all of a sudden, his book lit a powder keg, and people started killing themselves. So it's a little horrifying, but this was in Germany like 150 years ago. So it was just a historical fact at this point. So yeah. The suicide of Jerusalem, which had a great echo in that time, also contributed to this. People believing that they found more about this by reading the sorrows of young Werther. Moreover, Werther had almost nothing in common with Jerusalem, for it was Goethe himself, the one who actually led the suicide to the very end in the poetic plan so that he could continue living. Okay, yeah, so we were just saying, this end of this paragraph is basically saying, you know, the culture and the time, like the the times where this book was produced had a lot of things going on and like it contributed to it. It wasn't just Goethe somehow got just in, on his own, wrote a book of mass hysteria, but like it's a, you know, mass hysteria is a thing nowadays. So it's an interesting uh, how this happens. We, we still don't really understand how this happens, like the sort of mass hysteria based on like the way society is at the time. <coughs> furthermore, continuing, furthermore, what is there to be done when you are not capable of postponing your suicide by a masterpiece the way genius do? If you are not capable of creating a Werther who could commit suicide in your place, then the way of the fabulous character did with its creator, Goethe's Werther, remains the only chance to survive. So yeah, so that means you have to look at someone else's character. The really strong characters seem to have this, this un, eh, seem to have understood this since, as Napoleon read this work seven times, and in his campaign in Egypt, he did not leave it aside. Maybe all the people who wished to go beyond the veil could postpone their decision or even drop it for good by reading the sorrows of young Werther. In fact, this is the abstruse meaning of the author's preface to this thrilling book. And thou, good soul, who sufferest the same distress as he endured once, draw comfort from his sorrows, and let this little book be thy friend, if owning, if owing to fortune or through thine own fault, thou canst not find a dearer companion. Okay, so in this is saying, basically you can lean on this book in your hard times to see how Werther handled this, or you can use Werther as a crutch in your times. So, the, so for who suffered the same distress? So it's like, can you do this? Now that's interesting that Napoleon had like reread the book a million times. Like that's if you can know that Napoleon read it at least seven times. That's kind of fascinating. Um, that this is how Napoleon got through his uh, days. All right. Author says, therefore, I shall quote again from Emil Chiron, using his subtle formulation, not only from the author's perspective, but also from the one of the reader. A great book is postponed. A great book is a postponed suicide, or at least it should be. The ones who committed suicide with Werther in their pocket would have done anyway. For them, the jeopardy came from another direction, not from this book, which should be understood deep down, could have been for the foremost of the suicide the only possible salvation. Goethe saved them, saved himself by creating a masterpiece. The suicides affected were their mania, which could have saved themselves by admiring it. So, I mean, this is a little, uh, you know, excusing the problem here, saying, oh, well, they would have killed themselves anyway. Um, I mean, that's a little much for this author to say. I mean, the it's obvious that they did not follow Goethe's wishes that people who are feeling bad lean on the book as a crutch to help them get past their problems. But um, how would, yeah, I mean, that's clear enough that they didn't follow Goethe, but like the idea that they were inherently going to do it, yeah, that seems a bit, that seems wrong. I, there was a uh, legal case recently where they blamed um, social media posts by someone's 
ex-girlfriend for goading the guy into killing himself. And I think they convicted her or something like that. So the idea that you can goad someone into it is not like a crazy idea. Like people think this is you can goad people into doing things that are against what uh, their best interests. Um, I'm not saying that what the guy did or did not do was right or wrong, but that they convicted the ex-girlfriend for goading him into it. And, uh, so it's like, yeah. So, I mean, the take here on the author, I think is wrong, but that's okay. It's not like, this is not a deep point. It's just a historical fact that the author has no idea what these people were going to do if they didn't read the book. And I can't believe I got the uh, alert. I don't understand how I got the alert that time. Victor says, the book definitely has some parts on this. People seek ways to back up their beliefs. Yeah, um, that's right. That's absolutely right. Um, I'm so confused as how I got the alert on the raid, but I don't get any other alerts. That's so strange. Maybe I... Because it's in chat? I don't understand. So strange to me. Okay. Vipers, they prosecuted her? That means I might be able to sue Hegel's publishers. Um, seeing as you've never read Hegel and you said you'd die before reading Hegel, it'd be hard to show harm. So I don't know how you'd be able to sue Hegel's publishers unless they're like throwing the books at you trying to get you to read Hegel. But you have to show harm before you can sue people, at least here in the U.S. Maybe uh, you can use the uh, Britain's libel laws uh, to a great effect. I know a lot of people do. They're very... Uh, I don't know exactly what, you're, what you're, uh, you're under. But yeah, good luck with that. If it works, let me know. There's a lot of uh, shitty philosophers I'd like to sue get something out of it. And I'm like, I'm sorry I read your work. This has not been, uh, you've wasted my time. I'd like an hour of my life back and I can put a price tag on that. <coughs> um, I, To be a bit more serious, I mean, she was really trying to get the guy to kill himself and it was like obvious that like she was saying, telling him to do horrible things constantly. <laughs> you attempted science and logic. <laughs> attempted. <sighs> yeah. Things to it, you know, probably shouldn't have uh, tried. Okay, so now we're on the demonism of creation. The second work with which Goethe had a special relation is the Elegy for Marian Bend. Oh, you attempted science of logic. Attempted, okay. Yeah, not the science and the logic. Okay, um, well, I mean... Like I said, if you can find a way to sue someone for wasting your time and like f for a book you read, I would love to know. I mean, I could make so much money off philosophy roulette. Be like, you jackass! I read your paper and it was terrible, and I'm dumber for it. Okay, the second work with which Goethe had a special relation is the Elegy from Marian Bad, but the author's reaction is totally opposite to the one he had in The Sorrows of Young Werther. It is notorious that Goethe avoided any reencounter with this work for a reason clearly stated in his discussions with Eckerman. Besides, as I have often said, I have only read the book once since its appearance, and I have taken good care not to read it again. It is a mass of con congreve rockets. I am uncomfortable when I look at it, and I dread lest I should once more experience the peculiar mental state from which it was produced. What the fuck is a congreve rocket? I have no idea what that is. In what concerns the elegy for Marian Bad, Goethe's reaction is at the opposite pole. He returns to it often, and moreover, he is completely fascinated by his own creation as of something demonic. In, indeed, the elegy for Marian Bad is a demonic creation for a very special reason which we shall dwell further. Goethe's last love story, which gave birth to this unique work in universal literature, is well known. The poet, aged 74, falls in love with... Ulrike von Lewenzalv, whom he had met a year before when she was 18 years old in the same uh, resort in Bohemia. Okay, so this guy's 74, and he falls in love with an 18-year-old. Or 19... Alright, so he had met her a year before when she was 18, so she's now 19. Um, so this is not like pedophilia, but like this is a... Um, 
almost 60 years, 50, 60, uh, I can't add, 58 year gap. Viper says, the Congreve rocket was a type of a rocket artillery designed by the British inventor Sir William Congreve in 1808. The design was based upon the rockets deployed by the Kingdom of Mysore against the East India Company during the Second, Third, and Fourth Anglo-Mysore Wars. Okay, so we've got artillery. So this is like straight up artillery, as he's saying. Um, yeah, so it was hitting him like a rocket. Okay. It was, that's just the thing. And so, yeah, and so <laughs> the poet, age 74, falls in love with Ulrika von Lewitsov, who he had met a year before when she was 18 years old in the same balneology result in Bohemia. <laughs> All right, so we've got some really young girl with this uh, older guy at this point. Goethe meets Ulrika in the summer of 1821 at Marion Bad in her grandparents' house where she was lodged. He sees her again in 1822 in similar circumstances and in 1823 through the agency of Prince Karl August where Goethe officially asks her to marry him, his request being accompanied by a medical certificate which attests his physical capacity of fulfilling possibly matrimonial obligations. That's great. So it's like, yo, uh, young girl, I'm this old dude, but like I can still get it up. The comic, yeah, the comic side of this situation was never overlooked by the ones who had handled this episode in Goethe's life. I mean, this is just hilarious. Considered in a larger context, this scene is worthy of Don Quixote because Ulrike, Ulrike von Lewitsov never acknowledged in her long life, okay, so she lived to be 95, that there existed any love story between them. Even toward the end of her life, she used to say about her relationship with Goethe, Kein Liebenschaft war ich nicht. This sentence, there was no love, expresses the essence of Ulrika's constant attitude, attitude towards Goethe's last love. Mein Werner works. <laughs> yes, it does. Oh, well, I hope it works, Vipers. When I'm not a doctor, of course. When asked by her friend Mal, uh, Malin von Hofler about what happened between them at Marion Bad, she answers, I can assure you that Goethe gave me but a goodbye kiss. Yeah. So Goethe was a horny old dude, and uh, she's like, he like gave her a kiss on the cheek. It was the most that ever, when he was leaving, it was the most that ever happened. And that's kind of hilarious. Nevertheless, for Goethe, this is a love story which lived in a totally different manner, not only because it is the last it is the last one, but because it becomes a creation which will free him from the demon for good. Both the creation of this poetry and its effects on its author are of miraculous nature. Here it is, Eckerman's description of the most of the almost magic atmosphere in which Goethe reveals for the first time his demonic work par excellence. The Anna Nicole Smith of her day? No, I don't. Anna Nicole Smith knew what she was doing. She was going the other direction. She got that old dude who died like a year later that had a lot of money. This is um, Michael Jackson going after what's her name? Who was like 13 or 14 at the time. And like you hear Michael Jackson talking about how she was like doing things to like lure him in. And she like you talked to her later and she was like, yeah, I was 14. I have no idea what he's talking about. Like I wasn't doing anything. I was being a kid. And he was like, you know, putting ideas onto like he was like making things up about what I was doing. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, maybe uh, Michael Jackson was like his first wife or something. But like he had known her for years and she was younger than he was. So it's like that's the sort of thing that's going on here. Like Goethe was seeing something that wasn't there, but uh, whatever. All right, so this is the first time he reveals his demonic work par excellence. Stadelman brought it, quote, Stadelman brought into two wax lights, brought in two wax lights, which he set on the table. Goethe desired me to sit, desired me to sit down, and he would give me something to read. And what should this be but his newest, dearest poem, his elegy from Marion Bad. Eckerman remarks the fact that Goethe's love affair in Marion Bad was well known and that, in this excited state, written a most beautiful poem which however he looked upon as a sort of consecrated thing and kept hid from every eye several elements related not only by Eckerman but by other people in Goethe's entourage prove that it was obvious that he prized this manuscript above all the rest at the same time this elegy gave Eckerman a totally unusual impression causing him trouble deep inside yeah cause dude's like running after like a kid 
This happened on October 27th, 1823. According to Eckerman's notes on November 16th, the manuscript of the Elegy for Marion Bad is presented again in the same magic atmosphere in the trembling candlelight. The poetry is read and reread with a ra with rare a delight. It is difficult for Goethe to detach himself from this poetry. He loves as if it were the woman who inspired it. The elegy remains unpublished for a long time, and it is kept carefully together with other, with other couple of objects which reminded him of Marion Bad. Wil Wilhelm von Humboldt relates how, during the visit he made to Goethe at Weimar in November 1823, he showed him this work, telling him that it was the only one kept in his handwriting, and thus underlining the special meaning that he had conferred to the elegy for Marion Bad. All right, so. Like, I'm trying to think about this. He wrote this book because, or this poem, because he, you know, he fell for some girl. And then, like, he, like, he transferred all his excitement to it. And, like, he kept in, he captured some of it, his excitement in his poetry. So he captured something about himself that he liked. And he kept coming back to that to sort of relive this, um, experience. Um, yeah. So... And like it is a sort of thing. It's like you're not typing it up for other people. You're keeping it for yourself because you like something about this. It excites you. And so basically, he made some porn for himself. Is what it kind of sounds like. <coughs> Question is like, is that like what horror in some sense gets your blood going? Is that why people like horror? It's kind of like porn. It gets your blood going, and you kind of keep a special one for yourself. What keeps my blood going as opposed to anyone else's? I don't know. All right, continuing. In a splendid essay dedicated to Goethe, Stefan Zweig metaphorically places the appearance of the elegy for Marion Bad amongst those astral hours of the human kind when the human spirit is really creative. This piece of jewelry of German lyric is explained by Zweig by Goethe's theory on the repeated puberty of the genius. That's a weird concept, repeated puberty. Goethe alleges that the erotic exuberance manifested in most people only when young is recurrent in geniuses. I mean, that's creepy as fuck, really. Moreover, well, actually, that's not, maybe not. Both um, Einstein and Picasso were horny motherfuckers. Like, they were. That's a historical fact. Like, so they were both horn dogs. And so maybe there is something, I mean, this is a trope, but like, I don't know if this is the case, but like, they were horny motherfuckers. Picasso used to, like, he had, like, he was living in, like, you know, the hipster part of town. He would paint naked with his door open. And so people would, like, walk by his, like, you know, his door in his building. And he'd be there naked painting. And, like, that's how, like, he'd meet people. <laughs> and have sex with people in his building. And so, like, that was one of the things he did. Um, apparently, I don't remember who it was, but, you know, one of, like, Einstein used to go run off with like random women when he got famous he'd just like disappear for days and like go have like you know sleep with a bunch of people and then come back and show up stuff like that so <laughs> yeah okay moreover the connection between the eros and the creation makes the object of numerous studies dedicated to the author of the elegy for marion bad when very sick, his friend Karl Friedrich Zelter heals him by, read, by reading him his own poetry. His grief was gradually assuaged. His last tragic, tragical hope was laid to rest. His dream of a life together with his beloved little daughter had come to an end. He knew that never again would he go to Marion Bad. Ulrike gave his puberty the occasion to manifest itself for the last time, and this determines, according to Stefan Zweig, the deep pain expressed directly and with great sincerity in his poetry. I mean, yeah, feeling like you're a kid again is a very powerful psychological thing. So, like, feeling young, feeling fun, feeling like a kid. Like, that that can grip uh, someone's mind. The idea that, I mean, you're going to have another puberty. I don't want to go back to having puberty. That wasn't a fun time. But, like, yeah, feeling young and fun again, sure. I don't think I was ever... Well, maybe I was young and fun once. Now I'm just old and get off my lawn. Nevertheless, we consider that a psychological explanation like Zweig's, the one who has a real uh, Menschenkenner gift and who is at the same time a stylic, stylistic conqueror, is not enough in order to understand Goethe's special relation with this poetry he had always considered a sacrosanct object. 
for the idea of liberation from demonism through the from uh, through the elegy from Marion bad which makes the object of this thesis highly illustrative are two quotations from goethe you see the product of a highly impassioned mood in addition he said while i was in it i would not for the world have given ha have been without it and now i would not for any consideration fall into it again yeah so it's sounding like a, me a, a mania basically Generally, it is the same feeling of liberation from a mysterious force so rich in wealth with danger far more fraught. And that's the elegy also expressed in Faust in the last moments of his life. It's hard, I know, to free oneself from demons. The strong spirit bonds are not lightly broken. Yeah, and so this is going back to the, like, the psychological, like demons and psychology have a long history here. When Eckerman tells him that while reading it, he has the feeling that the elegy from Marion Bad is nothing like other poetry of Goethe's, he says, that, he says, may be because I staked upon the present moment as a man stakes a considerable sum upon a card and sought to enhance its value as much as I could without exaggeration. That's interesting because like if you're staking something, generally that means you have to put something up that you could lose. And so the idea that Goethe was horny after some 18 year old kid when he's 74 you're staking a uh, kind of your reputation of being like creepy old guy that like yes it's worth it to even be a creepy old guy if you can make good poetry being the creepy old guy and it seems like uh, Goethe didn't do anything wrong by uh, Ulrika because like she said the only thing that happened was he kissed her on her cheek to say goodbye um, so he's not really, he may have been the creepy old guy, but he didn't do anything particularly creepy. So it's like, yeah, but he did kind of have to stake reputation in order to get this done. Cause if you're going to have other people read it, they're going to see, wow, you're creeping after the kids, aren't you, man? The elegy from Marion Bad requires a philosophical or more precisely a metaphysical approach. There is no question regarding whether Goethe was a demonic man. This thesis is thoroughly thoroughly substantiated by G Gandalf <laughs> Gandalf thank you Gandalf so that there are is no point to insist upon it what we wish to underline here is the fact that of all the demonic people evoked by Goethe or who could easily be identified in history as being like that of Goethe himself is the only one who manages it in the end to defeat his barbarian and destructive demonism in a, tit in a titanic manner it is true that Goethe underlines the fact that the demonic is a creative positive and not a negative force like Mephistopheles. Nevertheless, creation inevitably brings along destruction and quite often self-destruction. The higher a man is, Goethe, said Goethe, the more he is under the influence of demons, and he must take heed lest his guiding will counsel him to a wrong path. The outrageous tension displayed by every reader of of the elegy from Marion Bad feel that they would have destroyed Goethe himself or at least would have deviated him on wrong ways if he would not have managed to liberate himself through creation. Yeah, so maybe in this, by writing this book, what Goethe really did was not be the creepy old man. He wrote it all down so he wouldn't actually act creepy and like, you know, ruin some kid's life. Yeah, suicidal, pedophile, creepy, what a fun guy to be around. But on the other hand, you know, he didn't, apparently, he didn't, he didn't kill himself. He wrote a book about it. He didn't creep on the girl. Like, she seemed to not really mind him. Um, so he didn't do anything about that. And she was 19 at the time. So it wasn't like he was going after 12-year-olds. 19, at least in, like, the United States, is legal. So we're not going to uh, beat on him for that. But, like, it's just very weird if you're um, 74 running after 19-year-olds. But like, yeah, so it seems that he was, a uh, he was at least making use of things that were not, uh, the typical things that people make use of. <coughs> and I don't know, like we could go read the Wikipedia part, uh, article. Maybe he was a lot of fun to be around, but like he also had these other things that he was up to, so strange and it's not like you can say that people don't like lust after like pretty young things they do just because they're old doesn't mean they're not gonna lust after stuff but i mean the fact that like you're going after someone so young when you're that old is weird but you know 
you like what you like to see. That doesn't mean your all your tastes change over time. But yeah, it's yeah, it's strange. <sighs> okay, continuing. Many other predecessors and successors of Goethe have done it. However, what makes this poetry unique in the cultural history is the fact that the entire demonic force of the author is transferred on the work like in the strange process of exorcism. I mean, this is a weird statement. How does this author here know that the entire demonic force was transferred to the uh, a work of poetry? Strange that the author is making this claim. They're just saying maybe Goethe was a better writer and was able to get more uh, of the thought into the work. Now, transference, like exorcism, maybe, but like, okay, but like, it just means Goethe is a better writer. The moment Goethe starts to write it down on the paper, the Elegy of Marion Bad becomes a demonic work par excellence, and Goethe, its author, who is now liberated from the demon, will continue to live and create like a simple genius, if I may say so. No, you don't just get, you can say it, but like, we're going to call you out on it. The idea that like, he's like, this, what? Things that happen are saying, like the author said, this is just making stuff up at this point. After the elegy inspired by Ulrika, he gravely takes on an overview to his work built up during a 60-year life, and it appears fragmented and scattered. Since he can no longer build, he decides to gather it. He concludes the contract from his collected works. He can now collect on. He can now count on royalties. He returns to his first companions of his youth, William Meister and Faust. This remark is found in most of Goethe's biographies. For instance, Friedrich Gundolf says, Almost everything Goethe will write from now on will consist of moral reflections and applications which are either calm, almost rigid or severe, energetic approvals and disapprovals uttered with superiority. In other words, all the works Goethe written after the elegy for Marion Bad lack demonism. Well, you could just say he used up his last bit of energy on that and they just kind of suck afterwards, but I don't know if they do suck. Um, but yeah, they're just not in the, of the same sort of work after, uh, the Elegy for Marion Bad. Uh, so it might have been the last big effort that Goethe had within him. And of course, writing is hard. Writing is very, very hard. Making a very good work of poetry is extremely difficult. You may just not have the effort at a certain point. He's already in his 70s. It's just tiring to put that amount of effort in. And so, basically, once this... L <laughs> yes, we're needing no hard. But, uh... You know, maybe you just don't want to do it anymore. And you can see this in, uh... I mean, I know some old philosophers. They, like, they've done a lot of great work to do another great work they could do it but like why but you know they could they just write their papers they're better than other people's papers frankly because they know what they're talking about but like by the time they're old they just want to you know they don't want to do that anymore they don't want to play the young man's game the <clears throat> and the young man's game is making a splash you go out there, you make a big splash, you make a name for yourself. These people, they've already made the name for themselves. Goethe had something he wanted to write, he wrote it. But, like, he doesn't need to make a splash. He can collect royalties, as the author said. Okay. Continuing. However, he will continue to be attracted by the elegy as by a demonic work all of his life. Oh yeah, and Vipers, you program. And don't you be telling me writing, like, even programming, it is hard shit to get it right. Like, you don't have to be writing like this stuff. You can be programming, too. That takes a lot of time and effort. And you can imagine writing a interesting program when you're very old. You can do it, but you're not going to want to put that amount of time in. Like, it's just hard to do something like that. Okay. However, uh, he will continue to be attracted by the elegy as by a demonic work all his, all his life. A series of confessions belonging to some of Goethe's close acquaintances may be invoked in order to support this idea. Marion Bad started to have a miraculous effect on him from the moment he felt felt fell in love, not felt in love, fell in love with Ulrika von Letzowitz in that place from Bohemia. At the beginning of 1823, Goethe was so ill that the doctors thought he would not live much longer. Goethe himself confessed to Dr. Hushka, Hushkuka, I am lost, and the news of his death had already spread in Jena. When in agony, Goethe uh, uttered a redempt 
a redemptive a redemption word marion bad he wished to drink water from marion bad and said that if i had to die i want to do it my way both these waters that he drinks with all his being and the arnicati arnicati flowers that goethe says he found in bohemia worked wonders naturally after this diet followed by an improvement in his health condition not only imaginary but also confirmed by a reliable person goethe suddenly rejuvenated his wish ardently to return to marion bad yeah his last uh, words were more light so it's like he ran out of light in the end in 1826, in, um, eh, excuse me, in 1823, June 26, earlier thus than previous years, the poet leaves for Bohemia, where not only does he feel completely recovered after the severe illness he had suffered, but he also lives the love story which gave birth to the elegy for Marion Bad. In order to understand better what we called Goethe's exercise, by analyzing this work, we should take we should take a short look into the way the genius was perceived during those times. Although both are creative faculties, they have little in common. With his well-known synthesis capacity, Immanuel Kant defined genius as the innate mental predisposition in genium through which nature gives the rule to art, drawing attention at the same time on the danger which results from the spontaneity and originality of the genius. The counterweight of the genius as creative faculty is, according to Kant, the taste, the one which tempers the impetus of the genius of creating works which can be placed in a certain cultural tradition despite their originality taste consists in disciplining or training genius it severely clips its wings and makes it civilized or plished but at the same time it gives it guidance as to how far and over what it may spread while still remaining pur purpose purposive Ugh, excuse me sorry it's Kant I'm gonna trip up if the genius finds its counterweight in taste, as Immanuel Kant pointed out in the Critique of Judgment, the, dem the demonic, as it appears in Goethe, must also have a counterweight in order not to deviate in wrong ways, as he says in one of his conversations with Eckerman. This time, the counterweight of the demonic is not taste, but wisdom. It shall not only calm the impulses of the demonic of which Goethe is possessed, but it will substitute it for good after the exercise represented by the elegy for Marion Bed. So yeah, so wisdom basically other not taste. So why did he not actually be creep on that girl so much? Well, maybe the wisdom kept him back and that allowed him to write. So it's not taste. It's like not. It's, I mean, you could say it's in bad taste to go hit on kids when you're an old man, but maybe it's more wisdom than bad taste. I mean, it does seem more like not just bad taste to go creep on girls when you're like, when you're like 80 and go creep on 19 year olds. <coughs> Quote from the Elegy from Marion Bad. Now am I far, and what would best fit befit the present minute? I could scarcely tell. Full many a rich possession offers it. These but offend, and I will feel pain. I will fain repel. Yearning unqu yearnings unquenchable still drive me on. All counsel, save unbounded tears, is gone. Flow on, flow on in never ceasing course, yet may ye never quench my in inward fire. Within my bosom heaves a mighty force, where death and life contend and combat dire. Medicines may serve the body's pangs to still, naught but the spirit fails in strength of will. With this demonic creation, Goethe becomes wise, saying, Why should I care such wisdom vast to know? His inner balance is reestablished after being completely confused by an equally demonic love as the elegy occasioned it. Goethe's hypertrophied will, specific to the demonic man, ceases to exist after the elegy from Marion Bad. To me is all, or quote, to me is all, I to myself am lost, who the immortal's favoritist erst was thought. End quote means nothing but that the demonic the demonic was left behind forever yeah so it's like after this whole like big old rush he realized it was just over for him i guess conclusion finally so i'm starting to lose my mind too i don't know if you can tell The Elegy from Marion Bad is the work which best illustrates in terms of creation what Goethe calls Das Demonisch what I want to underline throughout this essay is the fact that this extraordinary creation, unique in the history of literature, also represents a strange exercise process. The creation demon passes from Goethe's soul to the elegy for Marion Bad, which becomes itself a veritable demonic creation. 
After this masterpiece, Gertz's philosophy of creation suffers a radical transformation. The difference between Faust I and Faust II, around which so many disputes have existed, may be reconsidered based on the theory put forth in this essay. Friedrich Gundorf remarks that in the same way as Urfaust and Faust I occurred, Goethe's journey to Italy and between the two parts of Faust, there is the transformation occurred in Goethe's spirit by elegy from Marion Bad. The strange exercise which occurred in the process of creation of this masterpiece I think may be understood best by analogy with one of the versions of the movie The Man Who Walked Through the Walls, based on the short story La Paz Morel de Marseille. I am, I am sorry, I fail on non-English anything. A man has the miraculous capacity of passing through the wall until this power is transferred to his lover in their effort of getting rid of the harassment of some journalists. Something similar happens when Goethe's demonism is, is as it is entirely and for good transferred to the work inspired by a dem demonic love. <sighs> okay. Is there anything more to say about this? I'm not entirely sure. There is. Um, this seems... A little bit like you know yeah artists try to put their thoughts to the page whether in like paint or in words or whatever is there something uncontrollable about their thoughts that they they can then gain their rationality back by doing their art maybe <sighs> Uh, yeah, the bad writing, Pfeiffer says, the bad writing of this essay is like getting hit by a concrete rocket or like that hammer hit Paul Pelosi's head. Yeah, but he's going to be fine. And so will we. So, yeah, this is the thing. This is very, um, one of these, I feel like this author really, really likes Goethe's writing and they wanted to like say how much they liked it and they're very clever. So they wrote it in this w philosophical way. But the fact that like they're like, oh yeah, and Goethe is a true artist who got their thoughts on the page and were able to transfer full thoughts and full emotions to the page just sounds like they really, really, really like Goethe. It's like, well, I'm happy you really, really, really like Goethe and you think this has some grand significance. They did not show there was grand significance. They basically stated it over and over and over and over again. Um, maybe there's something to it. I don't know, but... uh. It's like, yeah, it's, it's an interesting thought. But basically it was right here. Goethe, its author, is now liberated. And they just declare it. Like, how do you know? It's like, yes, did his writing change from uh, before this and to the after this? Maybe you can show it did. Can you show that there's some grand psychological change? I don't know. Like, I mean, clearly he acted like there were certain, th like this work was important to him. But like, is there anything more than you can say about that? It's like, I don't know if there's some sort of demonic possession going on there, but like maybe that's a good way to think about it. But again, you'd have to do more work in just exactly what, you know, that means. Now, maybe was Goethe super good about, you know, using his creepy urges to go after kids to, uh, you know, use that to get some writing done? Yeah, that sounds like a good job, Goethe. Viper says, all that because sneakers hadn't been yet invented in the 18th century. Yeah, I know. They got hangry and uh, Goethe maybe. Oh, well, you know, maybe that's a good thing. Goethe may never have actually written anything if he just never got hangry before. So it's like, maybe you have to take people's Snickers away from them and that's how you get art. And then we will have a new theory of art about the uh, removal of Snickers and uh, how that actually makes great art and artists and writers and poetry. We just, if we only took their Snickers away from them. So, yeah. So, this, basically what happened here was the author said, it's not a religious thing. This is just what happens to, like, great artists. Because the they kind of, this is what they're just saying and this is how they're describing it. And, uh, yeah. And this is, the change happens when, you know. Uh, Victor says, the author, it's a Brazilian girl, and I will defend her as a Brazilian yourself, even though I agree with Viper, haha. -ha. Okay, I mean, sure. Well, you know what's interesting? There was a, is it, I forget which author it is. It was one of the other uh, Latin American authors, but basically they wrote a story about, I think they wrote it when it was, an, 
<laughs> that arts tend to be starving. Yeah, well. <sighs> they just lack Snickers. I don't know if it was a Borges or if it was Gabriel Garcia Marquez. It was, uh, my brain is shitty. But um, they wrote a story basically about a old dude who falls in love with a young girl as like his muse or something. I don't even know if they talk. Like they don't talk. But um, at a certain point, the girl does like like fall in love with him and they get married. And it was just like it seems like this is a story that maybe they wrote. Uh, like that story is like the elegy for Marion bad, except that it instead of uh, everything you know nothing happening, they get what they want and it all works out in the end. And it's just like well, excuse like the dreams of like old creepy guys maybe I don't know. Um. So, but yeah, so uh, the author seems to like. Goethe, which is not a strange thing to like. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, well. Yeah, but I mean, they're on the faculty in Romania. Interesting. So, they may be uh, Brazilian, as you say, but, like, this was written in Romania, it looks like. Okay, I don't think I have anything more to say. You guys have anything else to say? I mean, it's, uh... Your phone is listening in, and now you're getting stuff. This is what happens. Like, the world is very strange nowadays. <laughs>